If you would go ahead and open up your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one under a seat near you. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be talking about one of the more well-known verses in the Bible today. But as we get started, just kind of off the top of your head and think to yourself a little bit, what are some things that can exert control over our lives sometimes? What are some things that can kind of start controlling people? Just kind of think through that in your head a little bit. What are certain things that can control the way people that live their lives and think sometimes? I came up with kind of an inexact list of just things that maybe I've kind of seen along the way of things that kind of can take over and take a little bit of control in someone's life if we're not careful. Um, so I just came up with kind of an inexact list. Um, if you after this message, go home and do some extensive research and find that I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Um, but these are just kind of observations, things that I've kind of noticed about life over things that can start to control us as individuals. And some have even had control over my own life at times. Uh, so one of the things that I came up with that has a, can sometimes control us in our lives is other people. Um, anybody in here ever had a uh, person in your life that's no longer part of your life, and yet something they did to you, something they did to cause you pain, something they did to hurt you, or something they said to you can still kind of control the way you think in the present. I know that I've had this happen in my own life where some things happened and it bothered me, and it took me a while, a long while, to fully kind of flush it out of my system and get over it. Even though this person was no longer in my life, what they did to me continued to kind of control the way I thought a little bit in the present. Another thing that can have control over people sometimes is words from the past, maybe something uh, negative that somebody said to you or spoken to your life, and you kind of allowed that to become a truth in your life. Even though it wasn't true, you allowed it to be a truth in your life. And it can kind of exert a little bit of control of your life. Or maybe it was a past setback, something that happened, you got set back. Somehow or another, something happened, something went wrong, something didn't work out the way you were hoping it would, and you had kind of, you experienced a setback in life. And instead of just, you know, allowing the healing process to take its course in your life, even years later, you've allowed it to kind of still dictate how you think. And even now, you kind of get frustrated and angry if you think about that setback that happened, or it could be a past hurt. Uh, I actually know someone uh, who is older now, and their spouse cheated on them many years before. Uh, they stayed together, I guess kind of worked through it a little bit, but this person didn't fully forgive their spouse. Uh, I understand that that's a difficult thing to deal with. It's a hurtful thing to deal with, but even years and years, even a few decades later, that, that event, kind of controlled how they thought and made them angry still in the presence. And I know some people even have substances uh, that control them. Uh, I know I've been uh, doing some work with somebody, an individual who is uh, experienced and had to have a liver disease, and it's due mostly probably to alcohol. They've been drinking a lot. Uh, and what has happened was this person got some treatment, kind of got a little bit better a little bit, and it's not looking good. The prognosis for the outcome of his life is not very good right now, but he got... Uh, basically put back into his own home where he was allowed to go back home. And what does this individual do? He goes back to the very things um, that is, were causing him destruction in his life to begin with. And it kind of exerts this control over his life. And other people, it's money. Money can control people at times, the pursuit of money. There's nothing wrong with money. Uh, but the Bible teaches that money, there's nothing wrong with money, but that money is the root of all kinds of evil. So it's not money itself that's bad, but it's uh, the, the, the issues that can come with an over, overly uh, possessive kind of pursuit of money that can capture us sometimes. And I've seen people who are just obsessed with making money. It's all about making money. It's not what they're doing as a service to the world that's important. It's how they can make more money becomes their pursuit and their obsession. And even some people, uh, this idea of getting famous uh, can kind of take control of their lives a little bit. And I remember a local band, a Charleston band, got formed about 10 years ago. And so they were kind of, I guess, kind of got to that mid-major level of a band. They were like this rock band and everything. And I knew one of the members of the band. And what had happened was, in order to, I think in order to sign with this label, the label asked them to basically cut one of their musicians. It might have been the drummer or something. Um, 
And so anyway, this label or whoever asked them basically to get rid of this one member who's their friend. And they did so. They got rid of this person. There's this big blow up and all these relational tensions and parents of the guy got mad and all this mess started going on. Uh, and their pursuit of trying to make it, they ended up trampling over somebody else. And uh, all that to say, the band never quite made it. They had kind of very moderate success. And then some members started leaving and it just kind of collapsed a little bit. But those are just kind of a few things that if we're not careful can kind of start controlling our lives a little bit. And the truth of the matter is if God is not in complete control of our lives and he is not first place in our lives in everything we do, the chances are something else will take the forefront of our hearts and our minds. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 starting in verse 28 through 34. And this is Jesus speaking. This is what he says. He says, and why do you worry about clothes? So he gets into this whole uh, talk about the things that cause us to worry. He says, why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor, Solomon was the king and one of the richest men of his time, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So the people were struggling with worries about things in life, and they were concerned, overly concerned with the things of life. And Jesus is basically saying, Will he not much more clothe you, take care of you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And here's the verse I want us to focus on in verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So what I want us to focus on is this passage in verse 33. It says, seek First, his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, keep the main thing the main thing. Don't let these other side distractions which can so easily come in and take over consume you. And I know one of the things that God has been working on in my heart, it's something that I've always known. It's kind of a basic Christian principle. And God has basically been kind of re-emphasizing this to me Uh, here in the last month or so, is the utmost importance of having a daily time with God. Setting aside 10, 15 minutes, it doesn't really even matter how long. It is setting aside time each day to spend time reading the Bible. And he's been kind of hammering this on me a little bit, and I've I've been reading my Bible for years, pretty much every day, I think, to be honest, not to talk my own horn, but I think I maybe missed like one day in the last 10 years or so or something like that. But who's keeping track of it? I mean, it's not like I keep track of that stuff. Um, but anyway, I missed like one day. So I've been, you know, I'm kind of a disciplined type personality, so it's not too hard for me to implement kind of some disciplines in my life. Uh, but one of the things I noticed over the last couple of years is my uh, Bible time started to kind of taper off a little bit. And I became kind of lackadaisical with it and just kind of slack with it. I mean, I was doing it, but I wasn't like kind of putting the effort that I once put into it. And so recently God started to kind of press on me a little bit, say, hey, wait a minute, I need a little bit more time out of you. And so what I started doing is, you know, I had my quiet times in the morning, but what I did is during this week, during the work week, I actually started recently, the last couple of weeks, waking up actually 15 minutes earlier to get that little bit extra time of Bible reading because I was getting kind of a little bit slack and just kind of cutting corners with my Bible reading. I want to encourage you this morning, not in a, uh, a way that condemns you or puts you on a guilt trip, but if you're not reading the Bible every day, I want to encourage you to start. And the best way to start is just read one chapter a day. Uh, if you don't know where to start, start in the book of John and read toward the end. But, it's, but it is of utmost importance for your walk with God that you start reading the Bible. I know it's a simple thing. This is not a profound thing I'm talking about. But it is of utmost importance that you implement it into your life. And I also want to encourage you, and I've shared this on Wednesday night, to not allow 
devotional books to replace Bible reading. I'm not against devotional books. I actually read devotional books. I love devotional books. But in order for you to have access directly to God, you need to read the Bible. Uh, Just you and God. And if you need a good Bible or a recommendation for a good Bible, I'd be glad to point you in the right direction. But the reason I mention this up front is because I honestly believe with all my heart that in in order to seek his kingdom first, this daily time with God, it all rises and falls right there in this daily connection that God wants us to have with him each and every day. So seeking first his kingdom involves simply spending time with him each and every day. And secondly, it involves seeking God's guidance in everything you do. Now, I'm not saying you have to, you're going to go here, leave today, and you want to go get something to eat, and you have to have God show me the right restaurant, or, you know, stuff like that. And I think you can kind of fend for yourself a little bit. But the important decisions of life, God wants us to seek His guidance. The Bible says in Proverbs 3 6, seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path. To take, And some of you here right now are faced with a decision. You have a decision to make in your life. And maybe you've been about to make that decision without even consulting with God. I'm here to tell you, you need to consult with God before making that decision you're about to make. Seek His will in all you do. Because if you seek His guidance and seek His blessing on your life. He will protect you from even decisions that may not be bad things. It's not always a case of immorality. Sometimes they're life decisions that we're about to make. And if we don't consult with God, sometimes these innocent and good life decisions will end up becoming an albatross around your neck later in life. And that's why it's of utmost importance to seek God's guidance in all you do. And sometimes, you know, we we have good intention, we seek after God, we want to seek after God. But sometimes these other things will kind of creep in and take our attention away, even little things. And it happens to me, uh, it can happen to every one of us, these little things will come in and start kind of controlling us and distracting us and deviating us away from God's best for our life. And a lot of times when this happens, when we start kind of going after other things, sometimes God will take the initiative to bring us back to him because God ultimately wants your heart above everything else. He wants your heart devoted and focused on him. There's actually a passage in 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul refers to this thorn in his flesh. And it says this in verse 7 through 10. This is Paul speaking. He says, In order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. And so basically this thing, we don't know what it is, scholars don't really know what it is, but there was this thorn in his side, something that agitated Paul in a way that he had no control over. And it says in verse 8, he says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And sometimes God will allow a thorn to come. This little prickly thing in our life, something that just agitates us, something that disturbs us, something that frustrates us, something that causes us anxiety and worry. Sometimes God will allow these things in order to draw us closer to him. And I know in my own life I had something, uh, especially something I believe that God had spoken into my life that he wanted to do in my life. And just like pretty much everybody in here, when we feel like God is up to something, we want him to do it right away. Well, God wasn't determined to do it right away. So here I was, kind of left with this thing that I was like, all right, God, this is of you. I believe it is, and I'm praying for it to come to pass and seeking God that it will come to pass. And what happens is it doesn't come to pass in my ordained timetable uh, because God's ways are higher than mine. He doesn't always give us the things we desire when we want them. And so what happened is over a couple months period of time, this thing that I wanted to see God do in my life started to become this little thorn. It started to produce all sorts of anxiety. I was worried about it. I mean, I was on my bed face down praying over this thing. That that type of pressure and agitation was going on inside of me. And God was basically, he was using this to start drawing me closer to him. And what happens when you're going, when you have this agitator in your life? What does it make you do? It forces you to seek God in ways you wouldn't normally seek Him without it. Am I right? 
Am I right? Am I right? And where am I right? Sometimes there will be something in your life it will force you to seek God. And that's what this thing did in my life. This thorn that was in my side has caused me all sorts of frustration and worry and just desperation. Prayers of just desperation. God, where, where are you in all this? And over time, slowly but surely, this thing bothered me and bothered me and bothered me I consumed my thoughts, consumed a lot of my energy, consumed a lot of my prayer. And over time, I finally, there's this crisis going on inside my will. There's this internal crisis going on. And I finally, and I'm not perfectly there yet, but I finally started to rest in God about it. Somehow or another, this, my will just kind of flipped the switch a little bit because I basically told God that I trusted in him and I kind of let it go. Just let it go in the hands of God to trust him to bring it about when he decides to bring it about. And since then, it's been about a month or so, this thing's just afflicted me for a while. And finally, I made that decision, God, I'm going to rest in you. And so the last month or so, I've been just resting in God about this thing. So what will happen sometimes, this agitator that's in your life, God is waiting for you to switch kind of flip that switch in your will and start choosing to trust Him and start choosing to believe in Him and stop doubting Him and resting in Him for the things that you have absolutely no control about. And I don't know when God is going to show up, but I believe with all my heart that He is. And I want to encourage you to believe the same about God. Because God is probably purposefully allowing that thing to afflict your soul in such a way. Because what it's doing is it's prodding you toward God. And in order for us to get closer to God, sometimes he will use things to prod us to draw us closer to himself. When we start seeking God, you know, passionately, because there's something we need help with, and that thing that's bothering us is causing us anxiety, and we're praying and praying and praying about it, what will happen is, is we're seeking God at a deeper level than we would if we were on our own. We start seeking God on that deeper level. He starts to show us more of himself at an even deeper level, and we wouldn't have discovered how great and majestic our God is if it wasn't for that thing that is prodding you closer to him and David went through all this in Psalm 18 he writes about basically what had happened was his life was he was fleeing for his life and he had these enemies against him these people were trying to kill him and God delivered him out of this pressure situation and this is what David writes after he's been delivered after he's on the other side after God has saved him from his turmoil this is what David has to say about God. He wouldn't have said this if he hadn't gone through the turmoil to get to the other side. And this is what he says in Psalm 18.2. This is David. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Maybe that's exactly what God wants to do in your life. He wants to take you to that point where you recognize who your rock is, who your fortress is, who your deliverer is. Is he the rock in whom you're taking refuge? Is he your shield and your stronghold? That thing in your life that is causing you all sorts of agitation, God is wanting you to flip that switch in your will, start trusting in Him, start believing in Him, and when He does bring it about, when He does deliver you from your affliction, you're going to be singing a song you've never sung in your life before. You're going to be able to say, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? I'll tell you where your help comes from. My help, your help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Whatever help you need right now, your help is going to come from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And for some of you, you may be in this time of sadness and weeping and anxiety, but I'm here to tell you that may remain for a season, but if you continue trusting in your rock, in your fortress, in your deliverer, rejoicing is going to come in the morning in your life. And you have to trust God. You have to trust and believe Him. You have to trust that he is who he says he is. 
And he very well may be using that thing in your life, that thing that's causing you all sorts of problems and anxiety and tears are welling up in your eyes while you're praying. God wants you to discover more and more of his greatness through the thing you're going through in your life. Do you know where, do your, where does your help come from? Where does your help come from? It should come from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God wants you to seek his kingdom first and all you seek him in all your decisions. Depend on him in everything you're facing in life. But what else does this passage say? Seek first his kingdom. And it's just, it, just, it doesn't just end there. Seek first his kingdom. And then what does it say? And his righteousness. We want, we want the blessings of God. We want the deliverance of God. We want the that we want God to be our rock and our fortress. One of the things we don't really like is this whole idea of seeking first his righteousness. It's not just enough to seek him for in the hard times, seek him when we need him. We need to seek first his righteousness in our lives. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, it says, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God. We are to be like him God says in the Bible, be holy because I am holy. God wants to mold and shape your heart and purify you and make you more and more like him. So what are some of the things that keep us away from God's righteousness? I know for men, it's an easy one. Sexual purity. There's not a man in here who's not tempted on a regular basis. My sexual prayer is something that we deal with. It's something we struggle with. There's actually a book written about it called Every Man's Battle. We're to go against those desires and those temptations that come our way. And the Bible says in Ephesians 5, 3, it says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. Even a hint of sexual immorality or of any, any kind of impurity. And I heard a story uh, about a pastor, um, someone I'd never heard of or knew about. Uh, I was actually reading a book, and the guy talked about him in this book. And uh, this pastor, uh, I don't know if the church was big or small or medium or however big it was, but this guy was pastoring the church, and he ended up committing adultery, falling into an adulterous relationship. So this guy who wrote the book, who's a pastor as well, kind of called him up or talked to him and said, hey, what, what happened? What happened, man? And so this guy, basically, one of the things he explained was that um, he started using his devotional times uh, to prepare his sermons. So basically, he would go to God and, you know, have his quiet time, his devotional time, but instead of becoming me connecting with God time, it became, oh, well, here's this path, I'm going to write a sermon. You know, he started using it as a time to prepare uh, his Sunday sermons instead of having his heart open up to God. This is kind of a scary thing. That's why it's so important that we read our Bibles each and every day because it keeps us in line with God. It gives us the strength we need to face the temptations that we're all going to face at times. And it helps us to keep that pure heartedness. And we're all going to fall. The Bible says we all stumble in many ways, and that includes me. We all stumble in many ways, James 3, 2. But we need to be people of God's word, people who read the Bible, people who cherish the Bible, people who live according to God's word so we can avoid the schemes of the enemy. Another way that we need to pursue first his righteousness is in the things we say, in the things we say. This is something I came up with. I don't know if it's true. It's another thing you can do research on and prove me wrong. I have this kind of a theory. It's a personal theory. And I think, and just don't get angry, I think that gossip is to females what sexual purity is to males. That's just a theory. Gossip is to females what sexual purity is to males. I'm not saying uh, no women struggle with purity issues and no men struggle with gossip issues. But y'all can quote me on that, okay? I want y'all to go to the water cooler where it quote me. My pastor, he's profound. He said that. But I really believe that. 
Because it's something that pretty much every female struggles with, and the purity thing is something every man struggles with. Uh, so we need to be careful uh, how we talk about other people. The Bible says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. The Bible talks about avoiding gossip. And I actually saw this little acrostic uh, on the internet. It's as, as actually on Facebook. Don't, don't hold that against me. I'm on there. I'm on there. Okay, let's just get that out. Okay, don't judge. Most of you are as well. Uh, anyway, but someone posted this acrostic on there, and I thought it was pretty, pretty, I thought it was pretty deep. And it was basically talking about the things you should or shouldn't say. And this is what it has, okay? It says the acrostic is think, T-H-I-N-K. And this is the first thing. I want, why aren't you ladies taking notes? Pull out that pen and paper. Come on, let's get right in here. So the acrostic is think. And it asks five questions according to each of these letters. The first one is T. Is it true? It's the thing you're talking about. Is it true? H. Is it helpful? Is it helpful? The things you're talking about with other people, about other, someone else, is it helpful to say it? And I can't say that everything I've said this past week was helpful. I've said something, why, why did I say that? I. Is it inspiring? Does it lift other people up? Is it a good thing to share? In, is it necessary? Anybody in here ever say something that just wasn't necessary to say? Okay, just me. Good. Good. I'm glad we established I'm the only sinner, and I'll be up front to pray, and then I'll pray with myself because I'm the only one who needs help. Um, K, is it kind? Is it kind? Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? How are you doing in these things? Just think back to last week, a couple weeks. How have you been doing with this issue of our tongue? The Bible talks about taming the tongue. How are you doing with gossip? We need to seek first his righteousness. Thirdly, the last thing I want to talk about as far as seeking first his righteousness is this issue of anger. This issue of anger. Anger is something that I, when I came to Christ, I had some issues. I came to Christ about 11 years ago now, I believe. And I had some issues. I had some anger problems, believe it or not. I know. Y'all see me as this just angelic, holy being, and that's good. You should. But before I became, okay, but why aren't y'all laughing? Anyway. All right. Proverbs 14.29 says this about anger. It says, whoever is patient has great understanding, but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. I know before I became a believer, and this is my excuse because I wasn't a Christian, I had a little quick temper, I had a little snippy temper. And I remember I was working at a restaurant, I think I was 19 at the time, and I was like a busboy or something at you know, one of those restaurants in Jim Creek in Mount Pleasant. And so I'd come in, kind of mind my business and everything, and you know, I had to walk in and out of the kitchen. Well, the chef's in there, one of the chefs in there started kind of like, you know, he's kind of being joking, just kind of cutting up with his friends, you know, his fellow chef buddies. Um, anyway, he started kind of just saying little stuff, like when I would walk in. It was like one of those things that wasn't directly directed at me, but I knew he was saying it about me. And so anyway, I didn't like it. So I kind of like just took it for a little while. And then finally one day he said, he said something, and I just like, I, turned, I, I just kind of blew up on him, just being honest. Um, and I kind of looked back on that. I was like, man, I had some issues. But I blew up on him. I blew up on the guy. Uh, the Bible says that whoever is quick-tempered dis quick displays folly. So be careful not to blow up on people. The Bible warns against being quick-tempered. It may feel good to let someone have a piece of, you know, I'll give you a piece of my mind. Yeah, I'll give you, I'll show you what's up. I'm going to let you have it. Uh, it may feel good, and you may even not do it in person, but in your head you're doing it to them. You know what I'm saying? You think, you're like, man, I'm showing them, and you think in your head, like, what you would say and how they would react, and they would just be like a shame dog, you know, just walking away. Um, but we have to be careful to control uh, this issue of being quick-tempered. And the Bible says in James 1.19, it says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I know another little issue. See, I'm letting out my baggage on y'all today. I don't know how I feel about this. Sometimes you just got to do it and get it out there and everything. Anyway, when I, for a while I had this little thing that I'm going to call 
you're not going to tell me what to do complex. That's what I'm calling. How this, you're not going to tell me what to do. Even something, so, hey, you think you can help me? What, what? You know, what? You know, I had this like kind of little immature, you're not going to tell me what to do complex. And I just had this little, t I had a temper problem. And uh, God had to do a lot of work in my heart. And he put a lot of agitating of people around me after I became a Christian. And he used these agitating people to help me learn to start controlling this issue. And sometimes God will do that. Maybe there's an agitating person in your life right now. They're doing something. They're saying something on a regular basis. It just irks you to the core. That's probably a good sign that God is using that person to teach you to start controlling uh, the anger. Proverbs 29, 11, Fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. How are you doing with purity? How are you doing with, your, with your, the words you speak? How are you doing in this issue of anger? We are to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. In what way does God want you to start seeking him first in? Maybe it's depending on him. Maybe it's relying on his guidance in your life. You're about to make a decision. You haven't really sought God's guidance on it. Maybe God wants you to start taking the challenge of reading your Bible every day and having a time with him, uh, either in the morning or at night or during your lunch break, whatever time works for you. Uh, maybe you just need to rest in him. You're not resting in him. You're worrying. You're worrying yourself sick. You're worrying yourself to your prayers. Just produce this watery eyes. You can't contain it anymore. You can't handle it. Maybe God is asking you to rest in your rock. Rest in your deliverer. In what way does God want you to start putting him first in your life? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you are so merciful to us. We all have times where we fall short of your standards and your glory. We all have times where we say things we shouldn't say. We think things we shouldn't think. We do things we shouldn't do. And I pray that you would help us to become more like you, that we would become holy people. We would, be, we would become people who seek you first, that seek your righteousness and put you first in our lives and all we do. And I pray for anybody in here who hasn't been fully resting and trusting in you. I just pray that your, your peace would rest on their hearts right now, that peace which passes all understanding. I pray that it would guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. That peace would just rest on their hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would lift up anybody in here who's just weary. They're worn out. They're, they're in this time where weeping is remaining for a night. They're in that season of weeping and sadness and discouragement and frustration. I pray that they would know that that season is only temporary and that rejoicing comes in the morning. Rejoicing, a season of rejoicing is coming. For any of you in here who haven't been having the best of times, that season of rejoicing is coming your way. And God is going to lift you up. God is going to take you to places you've never been. God is going to show you things about himself that you've never known. And you're going to know that he is your rock. He is your fortress. And he is your deliverer. And God is going to take you to that place if you will hang tight. You will hang in there with God. And Lord, I pray that anybody who's carrying burdens, you would remove them from their hearts right now. Remove those burdens that they're carrying. Remove them. If you're here this morning, you're carrying around that burden, just release it into God's hands. Release it into the hands of God. And also, if you're here this morning uh, and, and you're, you haven't trusted in Christ as Savior, just while everybody's heads bowed and eyes are closed, I just want to invite you to receive Jesus in your life. If you have never prayed to receive Christ in your life, I just want you to silently follow me in this prayer this morning. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that you sent Jesus to die in my place on the cross. I believe that he is ready to forgive me, and I want to receive his forgiveness this morning. I want to make him the Lord of my life. 
I want to seek him first all the days of my life. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.